Thank you, musicians. Pastor Ronnie, give me just a second. I really, 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 really like Easter. I mean, Easter is just, I wish every Sunday would be Easter. What fun is Easter? Praise the Lord. Amen. He is risen. Amen. And you know, I've told this story before, but most of you forgot it. Years ago, when we were all serving down at Ward Church, our kids were all little mites, and I came home from an Easter service, and I was all fired up, and I, I was just singing, and I was singing from Handel's Messiah, and I was singing that, that great line, He shall reign Ever and ever. That's good, isn't it? <laughs> Watch this. Ready? And now you guys, ready? Uh, and So anyway, I'm going around the house singing that, and our kids were all little squirts, as I said, and our son Brian was about five, and he's just listening, and there's this little boy, he's got about eight pounds of blonde hair and big thick glasses, and he's listening, and he comes up, and he says, Dad, why would you want it to rain forever and ever? <laughs> I said, no, Brian, that's not what we meant. Praise the Lord, right? Isn't it good to know? that there is someone in charge of the creation who will reign forever and ever and is reigning right now whether the world thinks so or not. Amen. Before Pastor does the reading, would you stand for a moment of learning together this morning? The question that we have is simply this. After Peter and John looked into the tomb, what did they not understand? And our reply will be, they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. So, again, our question is this. After Peter and John looked into the tomb, what did they not understand? Together, please. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. We'll look at that shortly. Pastor Winans. This morning's message is entitled, The Kingdom of God Secured. And our reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 9. This is the word of the Lord. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb, and he saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside, and he saw and believed. Still, they did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, thank you, Pastor Wine. It's for your fine reading. We have looked at the kingdom of God revealed, explained, rejected. And today on Easter Sunday, we consider the kingdom of God secured. Allow me to say to you that the art of preaching is something not totally appreciated or understood by many. Those who've ever preached, my colleagues and I and everyone else who's ever preached, knows that really there's more going on than meets the eye. There's a sense of spiritual battle, of unseen conflict, Believe me, there's a battle that's filled with unseen conflict. And God calls people into a, a setting where they're not always perhaps welcome or even invited. I must start out on a bit of a light but powerful note. A lot of years ago, I was invited when I was a seminarian uh, to preach at Manchester-by-the-Sea, a beautiful New England town right on the water there on Easter Sunday. It was uh, Easter Sunday, 1981, a long time ago. And... Um, there I am, and I got to this place, and it seemed a little peculiar because there really wasn't a church there. We met at some sort of community center, and the people were out there on the lawn about 6.20 in the morning, freezing, snowy, blue skies. It was kind of nice, and they all looked rather blank. And uh, so I preached for about 35, 30, 35 minutes, and I did the gospel up and down, back and forth, forth and back, up and down. And I saw a great deal of lethargy, strange faces, people looking at me as if I was from Mars. And, you know, when you're speaking, you can always tell if you've, you're engaged or not, right, Laura? I mean, you can tell. Well, I, they were just... Anyway, um, we went inside for... Some guy came out with a guitar, and they sang Kumbaya or something very spiritually deep. And, 
that was that. And uh, we went inside to have pancakes. And I'm sitting here with these people, and I realized that I was in the wrong place, and they had called the wrong guy. I said to them, so exactly what kind of church are you here? And they said, we're not a church. We're the Unitarian Universalist Society of the North Shore. They didn't believe a thing, right? So Calvinist that I am, I said, okay, well, now you know, right? <laughs> and, I, and I ate pancakes. So preaching is a, there's something going on when, when a preacher is presenting. I need a few of you, half a dozen or more, to put up your hand. Don't do it quickly and pray. I want to see, will you pray for me as I am speaking? I, I mean this now. You have, as I am speaking, there has to be a power that flows. And I see Ken, I, Pastor Ken, I see you nodding out there. You know, the guys know, there is something to this that is more than just words. Pray with me, please. We thank you, Father in heaven, for all of your mercies towards us. We certainly do pray. We humble ourselves before you. Have mercy upon me. And when I say something not helpful in your sight, please bring it to nothing and quickly. We pray for those here this morning who belong to the Son of God, who have the Holy Spirit within them. We pray for those who are not sure what they think, that they'd realize this day that you love them and that the offer is good. It's bona fide. It means it's really good. It's given in good faith that they too can be born again. We pray you'd open hearts and move in our midst, we ask, because of Jesus. Amen. Well, it is a most extraordinary thing to contemplate why a woman, actually with a couple of other women, would get up in the wee hours, perhaps three or four in the morning after the Sabbath has come and gone, and take a lot of spices and wraps and perfumes and go to the tomb of Jesus on the first day of the week, still dark. What were they thinking? What was Mary Magdalene thinking, a woman who had been delivered from seven demons. That's all we know about her, what she had suffered immensely in her life. What was she thinking what happened when she got to that tomb? She probably had seen Jesus' body placed in there. How was she expecting to get the stone out of the way and even get into the tomb? What was her life all about? Other than the fact that she clung to him, she stayed near him, she wanted to be by him, she was faithful to him no matter what was happening, even in the rejection and the crucifixion, she wanted to be right next to him. That's really quite remarkable in terms of loyalty and love. Because Jesus fixes people. He picks up broken, helpless, hurting people, and she had been one of them, and he had changed her life. I take a lot of teasing, which is fine because I do a lot of teasing, but one of the things people tease me about is, can I ever open a sermon without referring either to a movie or a book or something in history as some kind of illustration? The answer is no, I cannot. <laughs> uh, I, I tend to think in word pictures. I don't know what it is. I, everything has to be a word picture, so let me do that again this morning so as not to disappoint any of you. You know, you have to give our British friends credit. They come up with one great series after another. I don't know if any of you have seen Poldark. Now, Poldark is an absolutely fascinating series. It's based on some novels that were written by a Brit back in the 1800s. Poldark was a man who had gone off to fight in the American Revolution as a Brit, and he had come back wounded and hurt, but he got back. He was happy to have survived. And he gets back to England only to discover that the woman he loves, to whom he is engaged, has made plans with someone else and is going to marry a different fellow. It breaks his heart. If you know the story, Poldark then withdraws politely, and he goes to this old broken-down house that his family owned, and he's trying to put it in shape, and it's just romantic and sort of, sort of fascinating, quite a character. A few weeks later, he goes into town to buy some provisions, and there he sees a young woman being abused by a couple of men, pushed to the ground and roughed up in a totally unacceptable way, and he's watching this. So he, he steps in after a moment, and he, he takes the woman and pulls her back, and someone challenges him. He's a fighter, he's a rough guy, so he just slaps the man away. And he takes the young woman home with him, not to abuse her, to take advantage of her, but he offers her position as his housemaid. And you can see it coming. They're falling in love pretty quickly. They end up married. He rescues her. Now, the thing I like about the story is it is a Christ-like story. We're not here to talk about a fictional guy named Poldark. But that's what Jesus does. He rescues the helpless, the hopeless. He rescues those who are broken and rejected. And that was Mary Magdalene and others. They come to Jesus, some of you, 
at whose faces I, I look now. And the, your gaze is a delight to me because I know some of your testimonies, how Jesus Christ changes lives. And he rescues those who are helpless. So now we see why a woman would gather up perfumes at four in the morning and go up to a tomb expecting who knows what. But she is faithful to Jesus because he rescues the helpless and the broken. And it says when she got there, she found that the tomb was empty. Really pretty interesting. She's quite surprised, no doubt. And she starts back and she runs into Peter and John and she tells them the tomb is empty. They've taken the body of my Lord. I have nowhere, I have no idea rather where he is. What have they done? Where could the body be? Well, Peter and John don't know what to make of it either. They also know that a woman's testimony in the first century is meaningless, has no weight in any hearing. Usually it takes two or more witnesses to assert anything that can be considered valid. But they, they're listening to her and probably the others with her, and they don't know what to think, so they run to the tomb themselves. And it says they looked in. The other disciple who had reached the tomb first, that would be Peter, also went inside. He saw and believed. He saw and believed what? It's not clear. We always think, well, he saw and believed that Jesus had been raised from the dead. I'm not sure that's true. It doesn't mention that he, they believed he was raised from the dead. They just believed, they certainly believed at least that his body was gone. They probably went to the tomb thinking, no, that can't be. His body's in there. But something else happened. As they looked in, it says, they saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as a burial cloth that had been around the head of Jesus. And the cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Now, this is really quite intriguing that it would happen this way. The suggestion there is that the wording unfolds in such a way that it's suggesting proximity. That is, it's suggesting that here is the burial cloth, flat and neatly in place, and just a blink away from it is the head piece, the piece that would cover the face and head. This has relevance to what we're seeing now. They're looking at that and thinking, how can that be? It looked almost as if, no doubt, that the body had slipped out from under it or through it or something. And yes, you know the implications when you study the shroud and other things. I don't base my faith on the shroud, but the shroud is quite intriguing. Anyway, they're looking at that. And they don't know what to make of it. And you don't either if you're a skeptic about the resurrection. Throughout the ages, people suggested, well, that body was just stolen. That's what happened. They wanted to irritate the authorities or something. They took the body and they stole it. Just take that for a second. Now, if you're here this morning and you haven't come to Christ, but you're here, and it's Easter, I want to be an evangelist for a little while and speak to you. I came out of 10 years of atheism. If you think you're a skeptic, believe me, I'm a major, I was a major league skeptic. I played in the major leagues of skepticism. And, and here's why. This is a hard story to believe. I mean, let's face it. Anyone can say anything. Perhaps the body was stolen. But if you were a thief, and if you were a body stealer in particular, would you go to the tomb of a man who's been crucified, bloodied from head to toe, totally broken and bleeding, filled with perspiration and blood and, 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 and coagulated, but the whole thing is a mess, it's a hard thing to contemplate. And would you take the time to unwrap his body? Why would you do that? So you could carry the broken body down the street without the wrappings on it? And fold the wrappings and leave them? So why would you do that? No one would actually do that. So these guys are looking into that tomb, not grasping what has happened. Maybe they're thinking, maybe he's alive after all, but it says they just didn't understand that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Now, what's that mean? I have five suggestions. Someone else preaching might have five different ones. My guess is we'd overlap a good deal. Here are some thoughts especially for those of you who aren't sure what you believe. Why did Jesus have to rise from the dead? Well, you could say, of course, because the Old Testament said he would rise from the dead, therefore he has to rise from the dead, but that's not quite convincing. Maybe the Old Testament said something that they backed up and put in there at a later date. I mean, why did, what is the purpose of his resurrection? Why did it have to happen? Why did he have to rise from the dead? One, the resurrection of Jesus proves beyond all doubt that he was the Christ, the Son of God that he claimed to be. I mean, we can all claim anything. I could claim to be the governor of Michigan. I'm not. I'm glad I'm not. But you might say, well, he's a nice fellow, but he's not 
who he says he is, that would be ridiculous. Then I wouldn't be a nice fellow. I would be a liar. So Jesus was claiming to be the Son of God. You know, one day his opponents said to him, well, who exactly are you and who gave you the authority, Jesus, to go cleansing the temple and chasing out the money changers and all? Who do you think you are? And Jesus didn't really reply by saying, well, I'm the Son of God and you ought to do what I say. Here's what he said. What miraculous sign, they asked him, do you offer us to prove who you are and your authority? Look what he said. Destroy this temple. I'll raise it up again in three days. That's intriguing. See, John's gospel is filled with this problem. It happens eight, nine, or ten times where Jesus speaks figuratively, but they mistake what he's saying as literal. It happens with the woman at the well who says, where do I get this water? It happens with Nicodemus finding out how to be born again. He says, how do I do that? How do I get into my mother's womb? It happens in John 6 when they misunderstand the words, my flesh is real food, my body, my blood is, uh, my, my blood is, uh, the wine is actually my blood, etc. He's, 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 he's using figurative language and they can't follow it. It happens again and again. It happens here too. Destroy this temple. I'll raise it again in three days. And they think he's referring to the big, beautiful temple that took 60 years to build. But that's where he's pointing at who he is. They don't get it. And when he finally makes it clear who he is, his own disciples don't get it. We've all looked at this text again and again. Jesus tells them he'll be crucified, and they'll spit on him and beat him and put a crown on his head and then crucify him, and they'll mock him, and Peter jumps up and says, no way. You're not going to let that happen, Lord. That just can't be. That, that's not it. That's not the plan. Jesus. Jesus, you just don't get it. And Peter is rebuked by Jesus. Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Terrible thing to say. Satanos, the Greek word for adversary. You're just a stumbling block to me, Peter. You don't understand what God's doing. You have in mind the things of God, not of men. But he had told them, my point was, he told them that he was the Messiah and it would be validated by his resurrection. The first reason is this. There had to be some proof positive of his claims to be the Son of God. The resurrection of Jesus Christ defeated death. It means that all who belong to Christ will be restored physically to eternal life. This is very important that we grasp this. You know, when the Wright brothers were doing their experiments early on, they were asked by skeptics, why in the world would you want to fly. We don't think you'll ever do this, but why do you want to demonstrate that a man can fly? And one of them responded, stay with me here, and said, because if one man can fly 50 or 100 feet, we will have proven all can fly. That's the point. Paul says if one man can defeat death, then all can defeat death. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead will also come through a man. In other words, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, not of Lazarus or the other people, because they died again. The heavenly eternal resurrection physically of Jesus and the changing of his body, if that happened to him, it can happen to me. It can happen to Sally. It can happen to Paul. He is saying because he was raised that way, the Christian can be raised that way. Jesus defeats death with his resurrection. Then, look at it this way. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead established the ultimate destruction of Satan. We're living in a curious time, aren't we? The evidence for Satan is all about us, and yet research shows most people don't believe in a personal devil. Isn't that interesting? Ross Dothet, a, a writer whose stuff I read, had an interesting column recently about horror movies. He said, now think about this with horror movies. You go to a horror movie and it's implied that there is such a thing as evil and there's such a thing as a devil. Almost everybody would admit that as they're watching the movie, but they're not sure about the God part. That's really interesting. Yes, the devil is a real being. Of all things at this time, do we not see this? Do we not see the work of Satan? Look at what's happening all around our world. Look at the Middle East. Yeah, look, look at Brussels the other day, and look at San, uh, San Antonio or, 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 or San Bernardino, and look at, look at Paris, and look at all that's happening. ISIS, what is all that, if not the work of the devil? You know, I, I will say this, and I want to say it with clarity. The good news is that most Muslims, especially the few that I've known, are peaceful, gentle, nice people. They don't want to hurt anybody. 
But the best thing we Christians can do, I'm digressing but not by much, is pray for our Muslim friends. Pray that they will realize that they must come against that radical portion of, the, of Islamic faith because it is in there. It isn't just interpretive. Islam teaches again and again that the way to handle your enemy is to lop off his head and to oppose him and destroy him. And that's why you're seeing so much persecution of Christians. Satan loves this. It is of the devil. Now, you may say, no, Pastor, you just reached out pretty far to say Islam is of the devil. Count on it. It, it is. It is a sub-Christian cult, and it hates the cross of Christ. More so, it hates the resurrection of Christ. Most Muslims do not know this. I personally have had enough discussions. I validate this to you. Islam teaches somewhere in its writings that it was not Jesus on that cross. It was Judas made to look like Jesus. Satan hates the work of Christ, and that's what's going on. But his victory on the cross represents the ultimate victory over the work of Satan. He's dead. He's like, he's like a wounded rattlesnake that can still snap and bite, but he is dying. Someone say amen. amen. Look at how Jesus described him. If you don't think this is the work of Satan, look how Jesus described Satan. He said to his critics, you want to carry out your father's desire. Satan, he was a murderer from the beginning. There's no truth in him. And when he lies, he's speaking his native language. That's what's going on. And when you see all that murder and mayhem, Satan is having a field day. He is rejoicing. But his day is coming because of the resurrection of Christ. A fourth point might be this. The resurrection of Jesus from death means that we can experience as Christians his resurrection power right now. That's particularly intriguing to me. I have personally suffered, even in my Christian walk over the years, at times with depression, anxiety, discouragement, a lack of zeal or motivation, concern, worry. I'm human. I'm flesh. I'm not saying we should never have those experiences. We, we do have them. Reality is that we're fallen, living in a fallen world. But we lose track of the resurrection power. There's a mistake that is made about the resurrection. It, it goes like this. I see the resurrection as something in the past. Jesus was resurrected. I see it as something in the future to look forward to. But I don't really know what to do with it right now. That's the point. Paul said this. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. I want his resurrected self to work in me and to flow through me. I want to share in his suffering. I want to become like him in his death. But I want that resurrection power. The next time you're totally defeated, you need to say to yourself, you know what I am? I'm a computer with software in it that isn't turned on. Because the power of his resurrection, if you are born again, if you've been born of the Spirit, is available to you. I'm not saying just we'll make everything go fine and the rest of the day will be hockey and dory. No, you may still struggle. We have thorns in the flesh. But his resurrection power isn't just for the future. It's for right now. I love, that con I love to contemplate that thought. That resurrection says to me, I'm going to do things in your life, Richard, you've never contemplated or imagined. And finally, one last thought. Did I read this passage to you? Let me read it. And you, oh, thank you. I'll do it. Even I'll read it again. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give you mortal bodies through his spirit. He'll live in, in you. <clears throat> his resurrection power is available to you. And then finally, the resurrection of Jesus Christ delivers the Christians from all fear of death. I remember before I was a believer, I didn't really fear death. I just didn't want to think about it much. And I suppose I didn't fear it. I just thought, well, <clears throat> I'll deal with that literally later. Yesterday morning, I took a ride early in the morning over to Beaumont Hospital in the Troy campus, which is like going to the uttermost parts of the world. It's like <laughs> on Mars over there. And uh, no complaints. It's just, where is this place? And I went there to see a friend, Gary. Gary's been in Cornerstone for many years. Because Gary is very sick. He's had five or six serious operations, and he's weak, and he's lying on his bed. But 24 years ago today, on Easter Sunday of 1992, Gary sat in this sanctuary and responded to an opportunity to be saved, and he gave his life to the Lord. It was a marvelous event. Terry and Jeanette Prisk had brought Gary and his wife here, Gary and Mary, and they prayed, and they received the Lord. So there it is, 24 years later, he's really sick. I'm not sure he's going to pull through, but I go over to see him, and he's lying there on the bed, and he, he, you know, he can barely hold his head up and speak with me. I say, you okay? I'm fine, yeah. I said, you don't look so great. He said, well, I'm better than I look, you know. <laughs> and the pastoral ministry is a hoot. You know, you get to talk to people about things nobody wants to talk about. Like, it's the pastor's job to say, are you thinking about dying? Are you, are you prepared? Are you at ease? The things people really want to talk about, but they're not sure how to bring them up. You've been there with me, John. 
Many of you have. He said, I have no fear of death. No, 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 I belong to the Lord. It was a great time of testimony. Why would that man feel so, frankly, so calm and so ready? I'm not saying he's going to die. I expect, frankly, I don't think he's leaving us yet. But the point is he's ready. Scripture says in Hebrews 2 that Jesus shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. We already looked at that. Look at that next now. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. You see, the person who's not yet been born of the Spirit is still laboring under the big question, what happens when I die? And when we're children, we can ignore that. And as we start to get older, we have to make a decision. But one never knows. Now, I have just a few more minutes that I need of your time because, frankly, the evangelist in me always enjoys Easter in part because it's just sort of like hitting fastballs right down the middle. Think about this. If you don't know baseball, that means they're easy to hit, if, if you can hit. <laughs> Maybe you're here this morning and you're not sure. I mean, after all, <clears throat> this could be a lot of baloney, right? I mean, it's written in a book. Here it says, empty tomb. The rest of the narrative says Jesus came and appeared to Mary and called her by name. We read the part where he came into the upper room. But who knows if that really happened? I mean, why should we believe that really happened? Nobody here has seen the risen Christ. How are we to take this? Is there a reason to believe this? If you're a skeptic, I understand those questions. They're my questions. So let me just say this to you if you're thinking this through. You know there's an expression, you can't be convicted by circumstantial evidence. That couldn't be further from the truth. People are convicted all the time based on circumstantial evidence. In fact, most of the time one might say it because of a reality of how circumstances work. So let me revisit for a moment that marvelous, clever Latin phrase that you can try someday to spell and scrabble, and if you get it, someone will tell you you can't use it because it's a foreign word. The Latin expression, recipsa locator. Now, you skeptics, you need to hear this. I'm on your side, okay? Recipsa locator means the thing speaks for itself. Something happened in those biblical narratives that speak for themselves, that prove something. Well, let me go back and suggest something like this. Here's an example of something speaking for itself. It, it's a summer night, and you're sitting on your deck behind your house, sipping an iced tea and just relaxing. And suddenly you hear a tremendous crash, and your house starts to shake, and the deck is trembling, and you hear breaking glass and bent fenders, and you realize somebody has just crashed into your house. And you get up and you run around to the front of your house, and there it is, Pastor Tweedy driving in... <laughs> If you think I'm kidding, <laughs> nobody on planet Earth can go from Brighton to Novi in nine minutes except Pastor Tree. And tailgating is his special gift of his, oh, like this. So there he is. There's the car in your living room. Pastor Tree is at the wheel, half knocked out. Did you see him do it? Anybody see him do it? No. Do you think he did it? Yes. That's recipsa loquitur. The thing speaks for itself. You don't have to see him do it. How likely is it that he's sitting in your living room all smashed in in his car and knocked out and you just heard a crash? That means he probably did it. He didn't really, but... I didn't what? do it. I <laughs> No, he didn't. I, I tell you, I, I love the guy, but don't drive with him, friends. <laughs> that's what recipes to look for means. It means you look at the circumstances and everything is pulled together and you conclude that's what happened. Well, that's the same thing that happened with, with these men that said they saw Jesus. Think about this. These guys were terrified. Yeah, they looked in the tomb and it was empty. Then they spoke to the women. Now, what did they do? They went and hid. 
They went and locked themselves in an upper room. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were there with, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Now, why did I show you that? Because these are men who are terrified. They're not out talking about Jesus. They want to be left alone. They're afraid that they're going to be scooped up and crucified next. And yet, just about a week or 10 days later, they're arrested for proclaiming that they'd seen Christ out in the streets. Look at that passage in Acts 5. The authorities said, we told you not to teach in this name. And the apostles replied, Peter and the apostles replied, we have to do this. We have to obey God. The God of our fathers has raised Jesus from the dead. That's what it means to say they were compelled by the evidence. No, you, you must be compelled and I must be compelled. No, I didn't see the risen Christ. I just saw men. Who, if, if I was going to write a fictional narrative, I would have never thought to put this in there, that they were up there hiding and now they're out in the streets. Something happened. And the something that happened was they saw the risen Christ. And he's who he said he is. Can someone say amen? amen? Because Jesus goes about picking up the helpless and the hopeless and the broken and the lost, draws them to himself and saves them. Can someone say amen to that? Amen. Pray with me, please. We humble ourselves before you now, Lord Jesus. It is our great joy and the promise of salvation that this is not just some wishful thinking but that the evidence is there. There's no other explanation except that they saw you because you were made alive, having been brutalized and put to death. There are people here this morning who need yet to be saved, Lord Jesus. Let me speak to those of you who are here. I say this with great respect and affection. If you've never said, Lord Jesus, I believe you were raised from the dead and that you are the Lord, please come into my life. Save me. Take away my sins and save me. This is the time to do it. You need to say to him, you don't have to come forward. You don't have to put your hand up. Nobody is looking at you. Eyes are closed, including mine. But why not do as so many have done? Say, Jesus, it's apparent. You are who you said you are. Please save me, risen Christ. Now we sing to you, Lord Jesus, and we pray in your name.